From Deep Inside the Death Star, I'm Andrew Richards. And I'm Chris Jackson. And welcome to Defrag Tools, the show that takes you inside Windows and inside Microsoft. Chris Jackson's back, aka App Compat Guy, talking about App Compat. So Indeed. There is a new system or a service called Desktop App Compat. We're calling Desktop App Assure. Oh, sure. Ah, You'll get it right eventually. I'll get it right. Uh, you have an AKA for it that makes it an easy way to remember. It's so I, I opened it up. Yeah, this, so this is not an official name, just to be very clear <laughs> to all the branding folks. Uh, but it helps me remember, right? Uh, AKA.ms forward slash 800 app compat. Great number. We haven't got the phone number, obviously. But uh, I, it is actually available. I, we did check on that, and uh, I can't find anyone who wants to sponsor it. And I don't uh, want to personally own it and redirect it to my phone. I was, I was just going to say, your phone's available. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all, that's exactly what I need. Uh, cool. So maybe give us a, a quick uh, explanation of what it is and, and why we're launching that. Sure. Well, it's, uh, it's something that we, we pre-announced before Ignite and then started talking about it at Ignite. Uh, and really what we were going for is, how do we share the risk with you? We keep making all of these grandiose promises of, you know, if it worked on the previous version of Windows, it'll work on the next one. And we've been saying that basically as long as I've been here. I remember we said that for Vista. Yeah. Um, and Vista had an average of a 21% failure rate, yet we said it was highly compatible. Right? So yeah. there's a varying definitions of what that means. Uh, and obviously we've gotten a lot more serious about this to the point where, you know, compatibility is super, super important and we're making commitments. This is just putting teeth behind it. We're saying, you know, we're so sure, right, that if we get it wrong, give it to us and Bring we'll it. fix it for free. Yeah, that's very cool. So what type of generic things do people, do we just, that get tripped up here? I mean, what are the things, what are the mistakes that are happening that it was working in Vista, it was working in, uh, in 7, 8, 8, 1, 10, then all of a sudden it doesn't work. What's the thing that's happened that maybe tripped these things up? So that's actually changed quite a lot. Um, so when we looked at like the transition from XP to Vista, so if anyone who's on Windows 7 today, probably the last transition they remember is XP to 7, which is what, what most enterprises did. Um, and the big transition there was moving from a default posture of everyone's an admin to a default posture of everyone's a standard user. Mm -hmm. right? Everyone always says, oh, UAC broke my app. And what I would say is UAC is actually a suite of technologies that fixes apps. Clearly not all of them, mm. um, but it's designed to fix them. What breaks them is not being an admin anymore, mm. right? And that was a, a huge impact going forward. Since then, it's you know the number of failing apps has gone lower. In fact, the the big change, my favorite change in the whole compatibility world, was starting in Windows 8.1, where we now, when you check the version of Windows, we lie by default now. Mm. Like if you don't put in a compatibility manifest, we just say, oh, I'm Windows 8.0. Yeah, forever. Forever. So I know that there's obviously more security in the operating system, like CFG and all these other things. Mm -hmm. That's that really where the residual compatibility problems lie, where we're just putting more layers of security on security on security, and these really, quite frankly, hacky type approaches to development where you're patching assembler and stuff. Is that the things that are kind of tripping up these days? It's a lot of it's. I mean, what you're, what it really comes down to is. Chances are, if you're broken today, right, and we, the, the numbers we have, you know, we worked with a series of customers to understand what are the actual percentages. Mm. Um, and we're seeing like a 0.3% failure rate. Yeah. Uh, and the challenge we see is that if you do fail, it's probably not for some reason that's really easily predictable, mm. right? I mean, so a lot of the security features, you talked about things like, you know, controlled folder access, um, you know, the ASR or attack surface reduction is part of the Windows Defender suite. If you're on E5, um, all of these kind of come together as technologies that potentially have a compat impact, but all of them start with an audit mode. So you can actually measure before yes. you go. You don't have to just deploy, cross your fingers, and hope for the best. You can audit, measure, configure, put in the appropriate exclusions, and then enforce. And you have that whole workflow. So we've, security, we've done pretty well on. It's the really random stuff that occasionally comes up, subtle timing issues. I've seen a case where mm -hmm. uh, even the, the exact same source code run through a newer compiler gets better optimized, so that thread now finishes first, grabs the lock, and you get a deadlock. Yeah, and faster machines help that as well mm -hmm. and everything else. We actually saw some of this last week with Aaron here talking about um, Aaron Locker on top of App Locker where you know, it would show you these 
mistakes about you know, security, that folders you're trying to access and stuff like that, and when you can go from an audit mode and then apply policy and, and fix the application, kind of a similar mm -hmm. uh, approach to a, to a problem. Exactly, because then you can understand your risk before you go. It's, it's not just a pull the trigger and hold your breath. Yeah, so uh, I think it's demo time. I think we need to see something on the Want to crank into it? Well, let's, yeah. let's actually, the, the, the inter interesting, the category of issues that come up so far. So we actually had a preview for quite a while beforehand. Uh, and we've been live now for a couple of weeks. Uh, and we look at what are the categories of calls that come in and what are people actually talking about. Uh, the first category uh, is personally my favorite. It's just people who are really trying to understand and manage their risk who will call us up and they'll say, nothing I have is broken. But I just wanted to make sure that you actually exist in case something does happen. Hmm. Which is a very important risk it, mitigation, <laughs> right? You need to understand your risk profile, right? Well, that's the thing, right? Because yeah. if, you know, but in the past, right, you're looking for a needle in a needle stack. That's a pretty easy task. Now, mm. if something goes wrong, chances are it's not going to be an easy fix. Mm. And if you're on your own to do that, because historically that's always what we had to do is say, you know, we try to make it compatible. You're accountable for finding all the bugs that may be there and for fixing them. Mm. And we've gotten sort of no part in that other than knowing that you'll be unhappy if we don't get it right. Now, you've got someone who has your back. We've got the best debuggers in the world who will figure out exactly what's going wrong. You don't have to be that person that knows Process Monitor locally and all these other tools that locally you're working in out. Now mm -hmm. you can defer to this expert to do these operations that are masters yeah. in these tools and these other tools that are extremely more complex that you know, nobody really should have to master in the world, like the debugger and something yeah. like that. Who, who, who do I have that knows WinDBG? So <laughs> the, starting, the opening volley is always just like, are you really there? Like, I just want to make sure there's dial tone on the other yeah. end of this line. Uh, then we get the line of people who just haven't, you know, and I, we, I blogged about this a few weeks back where we kind of talk about what are some of the basics you can do? Like, is there an update that I just haven't applied? Like, mm. that hygiene stuff around apps are coming up. So we start digging into some of the things that we really find. And the interesting bit is uh, we see a lot of people retiring technical debt. Right? I'll, I'll show you an example. I've, I've actually reproduced the issue because I didn't want to bring an actual company's yeah. uh, application on there. Um, but this one is something that's sitting in Excel, right? And that's sort of an important thing when we start talking about what's in bounds, what's out of bounds is, this is not just my Win32. This is, if it's in Office Pro Plus, we want to make sure that you can stay current with Office Pro. It's the whole sort of Microsoft 365 story. Right? Yep. So we'll deal with Office apps uh, for Office Pro Plus. We'll deal with Windows, Win32 apps, right? WinForms apps, also something that are capable, uh, or even the web. So if you have an old website, uh, and here's an example of the kind of the vintage of web applications that we kind of tend to run across. Like some of them, it feels pretty modern, right? But believe it or not, uh, this is an older application. Mm -hmm. uh, the web is in scope as well. So if you have somebody that was working on a legacy version of IE, right? If it works on IE 11, regardless of doc mode, we want to make sure that, that still works really well for you uh, in IE 11 on Windows 10, so you can stay current in that regard. So, so we're talking about both Microsoft applications and also you can present your own say line of business application or a big application you buy from another vendor, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Whether you wrote it, whether a company wrote it, um, and th all that kind of ties together. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what we found. We'll kind of we'll walk through that. So here's an example of a, a typical uh, enterprise app. So number one, we just have everyone opening up macro-laden Word and Excel documents, and of course, clicking approve macros, because that's what we do, right? VBA is awesome. Yeah, I mean. It's, it's su su super <laughs> great. We certainly want to train users to do that. Uh, and then having buttons called push me that naturally people will push sort of in an Alice in Wonderland sort of way. Uh, and so in this particular case, like the automation, right, was coming back. And if we click back here, uh -oh. I've got a bug. And it's like, all right, so what are we trying to do here? And in this case, we, you know, we're opening up a website and we're navigating to a page and we're trying to interact with that page. Mm. And we're seeing, hey, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we want to do from a team is go through and debug this because for a lot of people, they're not really going to understand all the details of the OS. So if we, if we look at what's happening here, right, they're opening up a brand new page and they're navigating. Mm -hmm. But they weren't impacted by this on every single page. It actually turns out to be very specific to when that page is not in protected mode. Okay. So protected mode drops the integrity level. Um, and so what we want to understand is what is uh, overall going on in the process. So we'll bring up Procmon, right? And we'll just go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and close out the uh, document that was open before. And I'm going to rerun it. And I'll see 
that, you know, in doing so, right, we still get the error. If I go back to Procmon and look at what's going on, I can see, oh, we're actually creating two instances of iExplore.exe. Mm -hmm. And the way that Internet Explorer is architected, and we can see that in Process Explorer, right, and this is what our team is going to go and do. Um, I'm oddly not seeing iExplorer sitting in here, so we'll pass by that one. But yeah. Inter and Internet Explorer as an application is, you know, th the way it works is that there are two different uh, processes. There's the host process that manages the Chrome, the buttons, backwards, forwards, address bar, and all that. And then there's the content process. Which is the rendering surface. The rendering surface, yeah. And when you first launch it, we're going to assume that you want to start off with a low integrity process, which is what by default most of the internet lands in. Mm -hmm. In this case, right, the first thing we do is navigate to an internal site, which has protected mode turned off. So we have to then say, ah, this is a low integrity process. I can't change the integrity, so I'm going to promote it and make it a brand new one that's a medium integrity process. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to transition over to that and say, hey, you render this content. So we've launched two processes, and sure enough, if I start drilling into the details of both of them, they are medium integrity processes. So where's that on the screen? I'll oh, right in the middle there with integrity. Yes, yeah, let me zoom in on that, yeah. sorry. Uh, they'll end up being integrity. So this is basically trust-based, right? I've got tiers of trust, and this is sitting at medium. But what happens when I create it using an automation script is that automation is going to say, hey, give me an Internet Explorer process. We create one. We hand it the handle back to the content process that we create when we first launch, mm -hmm. which is low integrity. And if we then look at, well, what do we have access to inside of, um, let me open up what we have here inside of Excel. If I look at all of the handles that exist here, I'm actually just going to the lower pane view, and they're sorted by type, I'm going to look for process handles. K, elemental P, and find that I don't have a handle to any Internet Explorer process at all. Mm. Right? Because what happened was, we said, give me an explore process. We handed it one. We navigated out of protected mode. We made a new process. The other process went away because we didn't need it. It died. Yeah. So now I don't even have a handle. And eventually Excel just kind of cleaned it up and got rid of it. Right? Yeah. So if we got it immediately after it happened, we would have seen handle no longer valid. And then Excel cleans it up and everything is fine. Yeah. Um, it's sort of an interesting process. So that bit of automation didn't work anymore. So what's the, uh, the next steps here? I mean, you've kind of diagnosed it down to an integrity level problem where the, yeah. the, the, the two don't match or can't, can't co cooperate. What's the next phase here? So, well, the first thing's first, right? The fact that we diagnosed it that way, it's like, aha, here's a customer who probably turned off UAC. And that's a really... Uh, and in the past or in the present? On Win7. Yeah, okay. Because that's the only way it would have worked because this feature has been in since Vista. So chances are they went to Win7, they had UAC turned off. Uh, UAC turned off in Win10 is a pretty bad state of being in. So they left it on, and now they're basically paying back technical debt. Mm. And absolutely, also in scope, will help you pay off that technical debt. So whether it's just a, hey, we had UAC turned off. Um, I had 32-bit Win7. I want to go to 64-bit Win10. That's also OK. We'll help you with those as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one, and this is one I'm starting to see more and more, is people who are trying to kind of finish going their way across the bridge. There's a lot of third-party software out there that you know, sort of the admin elevation type thing, which is this app appears to need admin rights. When we remove admin, the app breaks. I'll solve it by just promoting that one app mm -hmm. to admin. Yep. And they, they've sort of moved the bar forward. They've started on the bridge. It's a great bridge solution because now I'm no longer every single process runs as admin. Now it's a select few that run as admin. Yep. But I want to finish getting across the bridge because you know, I have, in fact, gone from every process runs as admin to only my oldest and worst processes run as admin, which is like, I don't want to consider that done. No. I kind of like to finish. Can we finish that? Of, so, all, thing, of all things that are going to have a security vulnerability, that's probably the guy. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. You know, and because this happened to be something where we had access to the source code, right? we kind of tear through how do we solve it. Because the best solution we have is we'll just change Windows back to whatever it needs to keep your app working. Mm. Like a lot of times it was just by accident. Like, oh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't see that. We do tons and tons of testing of a big insider program. But there's a lot of software. Yeah. Right? And, and you 
can't possibly find all of the different permutations that happen, mm -hmm. but something we can change, we'll change it back. And we've done that about a dozen times already, and we've just begun the service. Mm -hmm. um, then the second one is, hey, if you have access to the source code, or if it's the vendor, right, we'll work with the vendor, because debugging is hard. It is. You have this whole 199 shows of helping people learn how to debug, and you're still not done. I have a career based on it, and I still don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> So we can come in and say, we've already debugged it. The hard part is over. Now let's suggest some of the things to fix it. Yeah. If it's your code, we'll give you the code. And then kind of the final fallback is, I don't have the source code. I hired someone 15 years ago. They came in, they built it. I don't know where they are. Um, there's nothing I can do. They don't have the source code anymore. Mm -hmm. What can we do? And that's when we look at things like app compat shims as a way to get across the line and then sort of flagging the risk to say, you are dependent on software for a key business process that if anything happens, you can't fix. Mm. So maybe look at reading that. In this case, we actually went in and said, let's go fix the code. So if we look at it, of course, I have the new code already here, just like the, uh, the cake already in the oven. Uh, what it was doing before was, hey, go to Internet Explorer application to create that, and that creates the yep. default one. Turns out there is a way to create Internet Explorer in Medium. Uh, you can either add a registry entry and then reference that. So Internet Explorer Medium is kind of, or application medium mm -hmm. uh, is typically how people will do that, add that reg key in, in H key classes root. Uh, or you can just call the GUID directly, which is what I've done here. So if I were to switch this. And basically all the, the registry key do, is doing is like DNS. It's just giving you a, a yeah. string to a GUID ref, uh, Just defining it. Yeah. yeah, we we like GUIDs more than humans do. Yeah. Uh, but with one simple change, right, we were able to go from, hey, we couldn't navigate before, you know, now it's popping one, and it's popping another, and it's going to where it needs to go, and everything's great. Everything is behaving the way that I expect it to, and now I've not remediated the application. Like page before it I no longer. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Need. That's very cool. Both of them. So you got uh, what's the next? Like you've got something more complex to show, or uh, what's the next? What's the next example? So I, I kind of dig into some of the examples we've used in the past as well. So. Um, just because this is where I actually start to see a lot of some of the retiring technical debt. Uh, so a demo that I put out, gosh, years and years ago, probably like around 2007, uh, is Stock Viewer. But this is all based on real actual case studies that a lot of people are just getting to now. If you turned off UAC, you've never faced it. So we see, see issues mm -hmm. like this dialog box, right? Um, hey, you're not an admin, right? And so, you know, you could, of course, fix that by just being an admin. Yeah. Uh, but typically, that's sort of an admin check. Um, so if you know, we go ahead and you know, finish running it, there's quite a bit of functionality that doesn't work the way it's supposed to. You know, so I'll just click on a couple of those. And I want to kind of quickly point out like, some of the tooling that actually exists to help, right? And certainly our uh, AppAssure team right, can help to do this if you don't have this expertise. Mm. Uh, for folks who do, who want to get more technical, uh, it's kind of a refresher, right? If you never went through this in the transition to Win7, mm. um, a lot of this knowledge has kind of gone away, which is what I'm kind of trying to resuscitate it of, hey, we actually have some really good tools to help that. Go search for Lua Bug Light. And it's a tool that Aaron Margosa is coincidentally yeah. enough, since he was here last week, he wrote this many years ago. In fact, let's actually see if he gave a date. Uh, he started it in 2006, and his last rev was in 2015. And uh, you know, Lua Bug Light is designed to help surface all the things that are on there. And, and the way that it works is it actually keeps two process tokens, two um, ID tokens of the user. It has a non-elevated one and an elevated one. And then it tries the API first with the non-elevated token. And if it works, it just keeps going. Yep. But if it fails, it tries again with the admin token. And if that one works, where the non-admin one failed, it logs it. So accuracy-wise, it's really good. Mm. Um, so let's go ahead and, and give it a try. We can use this tool to go and sort out why do I need admin rights. So we see, hey, that message went away. So it didn't give me a warning. And if I go to, say, you know, tools, options, it'll say, oh, nope, no options here. And if I say, you know, check for updates, you know, that's going to work correctly. You know, all of these things are just going to behave. So from a tester perspective, I don't get stopped at the first bug. Mm. I can go and produce all of the bugs. They have a manifest. And then when I'm done, I can go and take a look and see, all right, what happened? And it's going to say, hey, you were dropping stuff into HKey classes root. Which, as you know, HKey classes root doesn't actually exist. It's a virtual merge of HKey local machine WAC software WAC classes and HKey current user WAC software WAC classes. Yep. If you're trying to read, which one do we do first? Computer. For read? Oh, user, sorry, yes. <laughs> and read. if you're trying to write, right. which one do we do first? I believe it's a computer, right? It's machine. Machine, yeah. So if you're trying to create something that doesn't exist, we're going to try and drop it in machine first. Yep. For 
whatever reason. Whatever reason, historical reason, I actually don't know that historical yeah. reason. Uh, so this one is trying to create one. So we can either A, you know what? Specifically put it in HK current user if I want to have a per user registration. Yeah. And it's going to give me some kind of recommendations. Um, I can dig into the code and see exactly where in the code it has. I can see show me all of the distinct call oh, stacks. Nice. You know, this is managed code, so it's you know a little bit harder to read than native yeah. code is. But I can go in and find the code, or I can find the shim uh, that to address the particular issue. Uh, it's checking to see if I have an admin. What would I do in the code to stop that? Say yes. <laughs> Yeah, just don't ask. That's actually what oh. we do. If you literally, there's a, so there's a shell API, which is, is user an admin? And the shim for this, for the force admin access, is literally return true. <laughs> yeah. Perf-wise, it's amazing. That is the fastest implementation of that API so far. Um, from a dev perspective, don't ask. Yeah. Right? Kill, kill Once you've side. removed all the rights, don't do it that way. And then we also have, you know, if elevation is required, uh, so that we need to make sure that we're actually not using create process if something needs elevation that we use shell execute because of the layering in windows you can't get to there from create process um, that's a good little tip actually the that difference between create process and shell execute mm -hmm. that yeah, will invoke the whole uic thing and everything else that's very cool yeah well because you know if i am going through an elevation action i have a lot of dependencies i have to have a window manager to show me a dialog box to ask for an approval yeah and is what can I do with create process that does not depend? Should I have the window manager a dependency for create process? Is there anything I can do with create process that doesn't require a window manager? Mm. And the answer is entire shipping SKUs of Windows have no window manager at all, yet they have processes. So, I yes, of course we need that. IoT, server core, everything. Exactly. All these guys without a head. Exactly. So, we can't have that dependency on this higher order of Windows to do the elevation. So, we just say you shall execute yeah. because that's in sort of the same layer of bits that you want to have as we continue to try and refactor and improve. Yeah. And to be nerdy about it, even what the shell is. I mean, you look at HoloLens versus Xbox versus Windows and fine. They're all running a different shell. And so, that UI needs to pop up with different code. And so, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's another layer there as well. It's not just do I have the Windows dialog, no, do I have the dialog also on HoloLens, do I also have the dialog on Xbox, and so on. Yeah. So that's kind of, a, I got to kind of give a couple real quick examples of some of the stuff that we've done. Um, you know, we're starting to see a lot of cases. The first case was actually a pretty interesting one. That one didn't, you know, I d didn't personally work that one. Mm. Uh, it took the team weeks to sort that one out because we hadn't looked at that. It's interesting that Eric Lawrence, who's back at Microsoft, I didn't know if you knew that. I didn't. Uh, Eric Lawrence uh, actually blogged about that very issue back in like 2006, 2007, uh, and eventually they stumbled across that, right? Because troubleshooting wise, as you kind of saw, it's kind of suspicious. Like a, it, goes away, it goes away, grabs a handle, and the handle goes away. Why is the handle going away? And you've got to sort of surface up a lot of these memories because so much of our institutional memory lately of browsers has been edge, 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 and mm -hmm. the container processes and app containers and all of that. You've got to kind of dial back to, well, what was IE doing? Help me remember that. You know, we're going through the same process that a lot of our customers who took on this technical debt as they try to retire it do, but we're there side by side with them throughout that journey so mm -hmm. they can get to the Microsoft 365 experience they're looking for. So when was Windows 7? I think it was like early 2009? 2009. Yeah, so it's a while ago. It's, it's that, you know, paging that memory and <laughs> asking a bit much, I guess. I guess um, uh, there's a whole lot of blogs in that era that just are gold, I guess. I mean, I'm guessing, like you said, Eric has a blog point. But I'm mm -hmm. guessing Raymond Chan's old new thing, I'm sure has, has nuggets of gold all through it. And I'm assuming your blog, uh, the AppCompat blog, has... Yeah, has appcompatguy.com just redirects to the, the filter. I mean, I've sort of moved and joined on with the Windows IT Pro blog. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a filter that if you go to appcompatguy.com, it'll actually get to a filter of the things that I've written. And they're in the process of sort of moving all of my old stuff because as we're seeing, as people go back to say it's time to get rid of this technical debt, content from 10 years ago is relevant. can still be very interesting because yeah. like I'd never finished doing that. And now it's time to go back and finish that. And that's what we are always trying to make sure that we balance right is keep enough of the old stuff around while it's still useful without keeping it quite as in your face, mm. but still discoverable. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for teaching us about some app compat mitigation things that we're doing at Microsoft. As always, put your comments below. Email us at defragtools at microsoft.com. Follow us on Twitter at defragtools and also pick up at ch9 and also subscribe to us on the Windows Developer channel on YouTube. 
Uh, next week will be episode 200, so we might do something special. We haven't quite worked that out yet, but look forward to that. It might be a couple of weeks away because we have to uh, you know, film it and do something big. But look forward to episode 200. As always, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.